are going to wrap up on the delta method. I just want to show off this example that's in the book, and it's an example that they use to motivate the second order method. I know I, I've been mentioning that second order method. I just want you to think about the second order method in terms of motivating the first order method. So if you did use more, more moments or more orders in that polynomial expansion, what's really happening is those are distributed differently, each one of those orders. So if you add those together, you don't know what distribution you're going to get. And so I personally don't love it for that reason alone almost. Well, there's a couple reasons. I don't love asymptotic methods. I do like asymptotics in general. But I don't like using them necessarily for inference. I like, like them as concepts, ideas, see what happens in the limit. I do this in my, my mental thinking all the time. What happens if I just push this idea to the limit? Is there a break point or something like that? Um, if everything goes right as it goes to infinity, good. I really think of it as if it didn't, you've got a real problem. Um, I don't love using approximate distributions. So I like to, I understand at the end of the day, we're always going to have an approximate distribution. It's not the right thing, it's not exactly right. But I want to work on that and try to get it as close as possible. Instead of just muck that whole thing up so that I can call everything normal, or in the second order method, when the first derivative is zero, call everything chi squared. We're just doing that for our convenience rather than trying to solve the problem. So I think of stats and math as kind of a vessel to get you to an answer and give you insights. And so messing it all up just so it's easier for you doesn't seem like the right thing to do. But I totally get it. If it were the 1960s and you just had to do something, then maybe in some cases the Delta method works. Um, I'll motivate that a little bit more when we, we get into Bayes, that the Bayesian is usually trying to build their best model. And so instead of make the math as easy as possible, so we, we need computational methods a lot of times when we're dealing with Bayesian inference. Last night we had a, a preliminary discussion about Metropolis Hastings, MCMC, people will call this thing. Um, and we'll talk more about that a little bit and I'll try to sprinkle that into the class. So as we flip the chapter to chapter six, and you look at this discussion on the sufficiency principle, they talk about two experimenters, they have this comment that says experimenter two knows how to sample from something. I want you to slow down on that sentence when you read through that paragraph with the two experimenters, that's all you need to remember. There's, two, there's a couple different places where the two experimenters come up, the first um, introduction to the two experimenters. It's an old philosophical trick where you have two people debate with each other, and then the side you're taking, that's the person that wins. You know, so it's like the, the platonic thing. So Plato used to do this. So old philosophy trick. Um, anyway, you can ask yourself, how does experimenter two generate this random variable? And the answer might be metropolis Hastings. And so I'll try to bury in the discussion about computational methods. Uh, I'll also give you some extra credit homework that you can code up some MCMCs if you're interested. So I think what you should do is build your best model, but of course there's some consideration about how fast you can compute things. So there, there's this trade-off. What I usually do in practice, build my best model, build some flexible computational technique that can at least demonstrate that the method works, and then later I write another paper where I try to speed everything up, make everything efficient. So two for one, so everybody wins. We'll talk more about that as we get into the base. Let's just look at one more example for the delta method. It's where we left, left off last time. So I'm just gonna say, um, let's say xi's are normally distributed, and it's got some variance in here. We'll call it sigma squared. And so we already know that x bar n is a good approximator of mu. So this is close to mu. So this is just some estimator. So the xi is over n. So we can answer once we get to chapter 7 all the ways we think about what it means to be a good estimator. But we could name a few of them right now. 
So I know I've asked this before. I'm trying to wean you off of some things, so don't take the bait. What's a good property of this estimate? Go ahead. It's unbiased. It's unbiased. Yeah, that is one such property. Cool. Right on. What else can we say about it? Zach. Minimal variance. Oh, thank you. Yeah, it's minimal variance too. So, one more. Consistent. It's consistent. Okay. Yeah, that's even weaker. You know, but it's like okay, cool. It eventually gets to the right thing. It's unbiased. The expectation of that is mu. It's also concentrated around the answer. So there's more to it, and it has to do with that variability. And if you put it all together, it's actually minimal MSE as well. So minimal M means squared error. So that's kind of cool. So that means if you like measuring your losses in that squared error sense, it's the optimal estimator. We'll be going through that in chapter seven. That's what it's all about. So this is a good estimator. We also know that this is asymptotically normal. So that's just this statement, x bar n minus mu, that's the mean of the process, divided by sigma, sigma over root n. This thing is going to a normal zero. So we're in a situation where we might be inclined to apply the delta method. Where the xi's are um, normally distributed. So is that um, normal, not even asymptotic? Yeah, it's true. It's not even asymptotic, period. So you don't even need that. This is just true. So this is normally distributed. It's a very good point. So it's in this case, we don't even have a problem with the breakdown of the asymptotics. This is automatic. So good point. Absolutely a good point to, to dwell on. This is normal zero one, and I should say for all n. So we're not even converging. This is even better. So that doesn't mean that our approximation immediately holds. We still have an approximator. So this is a case where we can distinguish if it's the asymptotics going wrong or if it's the actual um, Taylor expansion. Let's consider a transform. We'll say instead of mu, I want a function of mu, we'll call this mu squared. So we could go through the work and actually transform the random variable, and that would be the right approach here. We wouldn't want to necessarily apply the delta method, but that's the punchline of this example. So g prime mu, this is the thing we need to look at if we're gonna apply the delta method. So we need that derivative first thing. We're gonna need to square that eventually. I need to keep reminding myself, to make sure you square this thing. So here's the delta method approximation. So g of x bar, that's just x bar squared. This is maybe approximately normally distributed with g of mu, mu right here. So that's just mu squared. Then I have g prime mu squared sigma squared over n. So I pull the n over. It goes on one side of the problem. So I'm not making any sort of asymptotic statement right here. I'm just kind of saying what the approximate distribution is. So kind of how you might use this whole thing. So let's just rewrite this. This is a normal distribution centered there. Two mu squared, sigma squared over here. And so this, S, this approximation does not have uniform performance. And I'll point out even for the binomial example that we are looking at, that doesn't have uniform performance. The boundaries mess that up. So that's just kind of true in 
in general. So X bar doesn't approximate P just as well for any P out there. So if you're near the middle of the space, X bar in some sense is a good estimator. I will point out, bless you, that um, at the middle of the space where P is like 0.5 in the binomial example, you have maximal variance. So that's kind of weird. You would think that it's you actually do better maybe towards the end points because the variance comes down. So the variance in just the ones and zeros. So you'd see the maximal flutter around 0.5. Variability in some sense can be your friend because it helps you to distinguish things. So we'll talk about that later. Um, but mu is kind of an unbounded sort of thing. There's no endpoints. And so I would expect that when we did things and transformed x bar, where x bar has uniform performance in estimating mu, we'll understand what that means in chapter seven. It's kind of some of that stuff we already said. This changes dramatically as I move mu around. And so the example of the book alludes to taking mu to zero. So as mu ends up going to zero, this thing right here goes to zero. And this variability collapses. And you can imagine if mu actually was zero, and you were playing around with all of this, this is totally useless. So this is the condition on we need this thing to be non-zero. So the second order of method only applies if that thing right there is zero. And then you're not adding that normally distributed thing to the chi-squared distributed thing. So I'll kind of point out that this just ob obviously seems like a terrible example already because this thing right here is always positive. And a normal distribution can go well into the negative side of things. And so I kind of understand the, the conversation that we could have about, well, we do that all the time. You know, use normal distributions to approximate stuff that could be negative. It just never happens and the probability is so small and we just kind of like ignore that. And so everything's an approximation, but this is just kind of a terrible approximation. Also, we already know how this is distributed. So how is that, how's X bar distributed? Some type of a gamma, yeah, absolutely. It's a particular gamma. It's a particular chi-squared. It's a scaled chi-squared, and gammas are scaled chi-squared. So if you want to work it out, that's fine. I don't care that you know exactly which chi-squared it is, or scale chi-squared, which is a gamma. Just that we recognize this should be modeled with something like a chi-squared. And the second order method at least does that. So again, not my favorite tool out there. I liked it when I first saw it when I was an undergrad because I could do the math. I knew Taylor. I was infatuated with all that stuff. But at the end of the day, very typically, this thing doesn't work very well. So what I'm going to ask you to do for an upcoming homework is I'm going to ask you to play around with this binomial example. X i's binomial parameter p. I'll, I'll call them Bernoulli's. How about that? It doesn't matter is my point. I'll make that point later. Dealing with a binomial or Bernoulli is effectively the exact same thing. All right, goes from 1 to n. We ended up doing this example where we wanted to look at g of x bar, or I'll say g of p, is equal to p over 1 minus p. And we ended up deriving this normal approximation, n, and we ended up doing this, p over 1 minus p. This was 1 over 1 minus p to the cubed. P over N. That's right, right? Yeah. It's easier when you write it down the first time. It's, it's easier to remember once you actually write it. So this was the thing that we ended up motivating before. So I'll just say X bar N over 1 minus X bar N is approximately distributed like this. What well, we ended up doing, and I'm going to erase this part of everything because I don't want to say 
that I can just flip everything around. That's kind of like what a Bayesian does. But I will say if you're going to build estimators and build confidence intervals and you're familiar with that idea, oftentimes what people do, and I'll explain this voodoo, I'll almost say, but there is a mathematical explanation as to why you can do this. This is called pivoting. What you would do is just substitute all these keys with X bar. And I think an engineer might think, no problem, I'll, I'll do that. That makes sense. It's the approximator. So if I want to understand maybe coverage intervals, if you know what those are, you can build them off of this distribution. So in chapter seven, they run a simulation study, or sorry, in chapter 10, they run a simulation study off of this. In chapter eight, they define what pivoting is. So this will kind of um, congeal in chapter eight, and you'll understand that move. But basically, it's that whole thing of substituting mu and X bar in like a normal confidence interval. So the thing that's random is not P over one minus P here. That would be a Bayesian way of thinking about things. But the endpoints of this interval are the random thing. So we want to see how often that covers the truth. I'm going to have you actually do that and simulate it. So you'll simulate data with a known P and a known N. You'll construct this. You'll build intervals or variance estimators and you'll check maybe your coverage rate. That's not the way the, the problem is phrased on the website right now. I just have you compute expectations and variances, and later on I ask you maybe to motivate to get a whole lot of neighbors. So maybe just looking at those two things isn't a fair enough description. So for the Bayesian, that's true. I would say for the person that's choosing the normal approximator, the mean and the variance kind of define everything. So there's some limitations to this. Theory looks kind of cool. Asymptotics look fun. Let's see how well it works later on. Should we move to Bayes? Let's do Bayes. After we go through this, we're going to be pretty linear through the book. So chapter 6, chapter 7, that's most of what we're going to be dwelling on, chapter 8 is about hypothesis testing and interval estimates. If you like that kind of stuff, uh, we'll get to it. Okay, let's do base. So we're going to do base. Bayesian does two things, or they operate with two things. So, first thing, likelihood function. Second thing is a prior. So, I'll point out that likelihoods aren't unique to Bayesians. A lot of people use likelihood functions. For a time being, they were controversial. Now it seems like no controversy. So, a lot of things that are just new to people, people have problems with. So, I think that early on, before maybe Naaman and Pearson were doing all their stuff, pointing out how they use likelihoods, people thought Bayesians are the ones that use likelihoods, so we don't like likelihoods. And I'll bring you in some quotes later on of Fisher making this comment. So, but it, it turns out it's not controversial these days because lots of people have utilities of likelihoods. It's more about how you use the likelihood. But what the Bayesian does is they just kind of penalize the, the likelihood function. So I'll just point out. Think about this. Likelihood function. What does it look like? I'll say in the IID case, this is proportional to i goes from 1 to n, f of xi, given theta. So, but I like to make the notation like this just to tell you that it's a function of theta. And this right here, I can just rewrite that is fx given theta, where this is just all of the data. Just get the statement. This is if data is I ID. If it's not I ID, you have to build in the conditioning structure. It's in there. I have to tell you what it is. 
So it's really just the likelihood it looks like the sampling distribution, but they're incredibly different functions. Sampling function is a function over the data space. So that's when that's variable. We call it a random variable. There's properties to that thing. It's got to integrate to one. And in the parameter space, it's a different function. I don't love the normal distribution to exemplify this, so I'd like to start with a binomial example. So what is the Bayesian do with all of this? They've got some function that's dependent on theta only. This is a prior. It's just some function that weights kind of how you feel about that parameter in different parts of the space. Now, I use the word feel. You don't have to feel anything to do it. There are quote unquote objective ways to derive these priors. I'm not going to take you through all of that. I do teach a class in the fall where that's kind of the whole discussion, which prior and why. But I'm going to have you working with conjugate analyses here. Things that we can work out the math, do things relatively simple, so on and so forth. If you want to know more about how you derive priors and all the properties, of course I'm going to say things about it in this class. But I'll say a lot more during the fall semester. But this is really it. That all Bayesians have a likelihood in a prior. Now there are things out there like approximate Bayesian computation where there's a likelihood out there, you just can't write it down. So, but in spirit, there's a likelihood. So I've seen techniques where you are able to back out from a posterior estimate what you think the likelihood is. So empirical likelihood techniques, which are really bizarre, but fascinating at the same time. So lots of different ways of thinking about that likelihood function. But basically, there's some function that connects the parameter space to the data space. In this class, we'll always be on the right hand. We're always going to have this parametric thing that we can write on the chalk. And this is just a weighting function. So if you're like me, you'll think about this is just I take my likelihood function, it kind of tells me where I feel good about parameters, and then I have some penalty function that I attach to it. What do you do with it all at the end of the day? You create the posterior distribution. So a posterior distribution is your probability distribution on the parameters given the data. And this is proportional to the likelihood times the prior. I think of it like this. I used to think of it differently. I used to think of this through Bayes' theorem. And I'll try to motivate it that way in just a minute. But it's really just I got some two functions and I'm multiplying them together. And so, at the end of the day, I don't do inference off of the prior, so all the argument about, oh, you have to have prior beliefs mean nothing to me. So, because at the end of the day, I'm just going to use the prior as some tool to give me good properties in my posterior estimator. So, really the way I think about this is these are just tunables over here in the prior space. If that looked like pi. So there are ways you could say, oh, I just have beliefs about theta, and they're my personal beliefs, and I'm building my personal inference. I think that's all OK. There's nothing wrong with thinking that. Convincing other people of something using that argument is probably not um, super convincing. It's not the most compelling argument. Well, I just feel that theta should be over here. So there is a branch of Bayes called elicitation where you couch the scientist or the engineer, and you ask them sequences of questions so that you can try to get what they think the prior is. I don't know how to do it. There's a book written by Tony O'Hagan, and it seems very bizarre to me. I like thinking that way. I think philosophically it makes perfect sense. So when I read Savage's old stuff or I read O'Hagan's stuff, I'm like, philosophically this is really cool, but philosophy frustrates me never do anything exactly with it. I always have to break it a little bit to get anything done. Um, so I'm not much of an listener. <laughs> you know, I, I'm not going to sit there and ask the scientists a sequence of questions and try to read their mind as to what they think the prior is so I can build their subjective analysis. It won't be compelling in the first place. It's still fun to think about. So if you're a philosophy professor, carry on. <laughs> you know, if that's what you want to do, argue that stuff with people. So it's a fun game. It's about how I feel about it. Very adversarial 
two philosophers get together and they just argue with each other and they both think they're right. They convince everybody else that they convince the other person, but it never actually happened. Okay, this is base. Let's just do a historical overview. This one, right? What's that? Oh, I was just gonna say 
think so at that time it wasn't even it was so much base specifically they were pushing back against, but the idea of chance was something they were. Yeah, people were just arguing about probability in general. So that idea hadn't fully caught on either. It wasn't until we did measure theory that people went, okay, now that I don't understand anything, I guess it's a little accepted. But if you put it in terms like coin flips and stuff like that, and connect it to things that are just obvious, that's not convincing for some reason. Uh, it wasn't probably until the 50s that things got really, really popular. It just kind of seemed like engineering what people were doing. In the 1920s, this word popped up again. Anybody have any idea what was happening there? No, please. Have I given anybody this talk before? Sam, do you remember? So, I was trying, I was trying to remember, but I don't know if I quite remember. This is gossip. So this is student, so who we know as student key. So student, and we end up seeing all these Maven Pearsonian procedures that are non-Bayesian attributed to this guy, but it turns out he was arguing Bayes for a large number of years. So he was working at the Guinness Brewery, and he was trying to basically um, build quality control procedures. And he kind of knew that things weren't normally distribute, distributed, which is a huge breakthrough. Don't use the normal distribution, backing up those tables. And he was able to derive the T distribution. What he did with it might not be what they teach you in Stat 101 classes, but he was arguing Bayes kind of alone for a long time. So he's a chemist. So no statistician yet. And he wasn't using the word Bayes per se. That word hadn't been invented. So 1940s, the word starts coming up again. What do you think happens here? This one's easier. Computing. Yeah, computing. So what was motivating? The usage of computers and algorithms. What was pushing all of this? You're right. So where were the first computers being used? Or at least this computer that I'm thinking about. I'll give you a hand, his name was Colossus. Well, we're too hungry, so. That's it. So we all saw the imitation game, right? This is the imitation game. So people are trying to crack codes, and a lot of what they were doing is they got prior information on word, word frequencies. So not English word frequencies, but more like German word frequencies. So they were trying to figure out the usage of words and patterns in words, and they were employing base to do that. So this is all the Bletchley Park stuff. So it kind of trickles through for a while, and then there's an explosion. And this is where I would kind of attribute computers. So a lot of people were arguing philosophy back then that this is the right thing to do in some sense. But of course, working through high dimensional problems and doing integrations can be pretty challenging. Nowadays, we stop at the idea of inverting a 10 by 10 matrix. You, you've got to remember back then, this would be like the hardest thing they, they could possibly even attempt to do. So a heinous calculation. Uh, so there's this explosion as we start seeing more and more computational power. So Bayes and computing are coupled. So Bayes, its utility gets fully realized once we're able to actually compute those theory distributions. So this is that evolution of Bayesian thought. So I want you to just stare at this. This is my um, evolutionary tree, if you will. It's very, very coarse. I can never talk about one thing without talking about the other side. So I'll point out that these guys right here are not usually known as Bayesians. And in fact, there's some ardent non-Bayesians in the camp, at least for a while when this picture was taken. So none of these guys were talking about Bayes at all. So, but these guys start pioneering Bayes. These are kind of modern-day Bayesians down here. So Jack Good, I like to point out him, he had an office upstairs for about 25 or so years. I don't know the exact thing. He was at Fletchley Park. So he worked in Hut 8 with Alan Turing. So he's in the movie, Imitation Game. It's all very mangled, the movie. So they got along with each other reasonably well. They weren't playing word puzzles. They were playing chess together. So there's elements of truth. And Jack wasn't the mathematician in the group because Alan Turing was a mathematician as well. So um, it turns out that who actually built the computer was Jack and Jim Flowers. So Jack could also know as I think. So Irving John. Is where that comes from. 
preferred gel. So he starts kind of um, talking about days a lot, and he brings the idea over to Savage, and Savage, I would say, starts popularizing the idea of days. Has anybody noticed anything peculiar about this evolutionary tree? Where's it rooted? It's be my most common recent ancestor. Most recent common ancestor. <laughs> Rooted for the laws. This is my tree. So I built this tree. Where's base? It's not here. So I like to give Laplace the credit. But obviously Bayes deserves some of the credit. So every year, um, IFBA, the International Society for Bayesian Analysis, goes out and cleans up Bayes' grave. So there's $2,000 that is used for that every single year, which is nice. But it's probably okay if Laplace well, got a couple a thousand dollars of that. So, but maybe somebody's taking care of this break as well. <laughs> so Laplace understands the implications behind what Bayes was kind of deriving. <clears throat> I don't think it's exactly true. I think that Bayes did do a Bayesian analysis, but he didn't really describe inference, like doing Bayes the way um, Bayesian statisticians do Bayes. He described the probability for doing Bayes. So it's not quite clear to me that Bayes understood exactly what the breakthrough was here. And Laplace picks up on it. So statistics is born. So we didn't even have really statisticians yet. Of course, people are doing scientific analyses, but they weren't principled. It's hard to repeat things. People didn't agree on the notions of randomness. But I'd say these are kind of your pioneers of just statistical thinking to begin with. And a lot of them had a rejection of Bayesian ideas. And we're not unfamiliar with. There is some sort of a, an infight in statistics, but I would say that the infight is really dampening these days. And I think the credit to computation can settle a lot of things. So Bayesian methods are argued from a philosophical ground, but not yet widely. So these guys are arguing with these guys, but again, people didn't have quite the implementation yet. And these are your modern Bayesian. So MCMC is born, Bayesian methods become commonplace. And that's where we're at now. What's changed everybody's mind? Performance. So predictions. So instead of just using the likelihood, it's using a regularizing function, a prior, a constraint. It's kind of a good idea. So this is Bayes' theorem, and I think we're all familiar with it. So um, we did this, I think, early on. Did we do an example where we talked about maybe hamburgers and milkshakes? We didn't do that, though. We haven't, we haven't motivated the basis there. Does everybody know the basis there? So, does everybody understand it? If you don't, let's just come back next time on Monday and just do a, a brief 10 minute explanation of how I explain things to somebody where this comes from. This probability rule is not controversial. I wrote it up in discrete form, but you can write it in continuous form as well. Um, and nobody argues with this rule. That's my probably my biggest gripe about Stat 101 textbooks, where they end up saying, here's the, the marginal probability of event A, here's the conditional probability, or they give you this information in kind of some hidden way. But once you back out this information, that's all you need to do the conditional flip. That's not exactly how Bayesian operates, because anybody in their right mind would apply Bayesian to that, to do this conditional flip. So what we're doing is we're flipping the conditional probability of B given A to the conditional probability of A given B. So and there's lots of examples that can ensue from this. So typical examples would be, given that you the probability that you've given a positive test result, for some disease, given that you actually have the disease, what's the probability that you actually have the disease given that you've given a, a positive result? And they're different things. So this might be the error rate on the actual method that if you have the disease, what's the probability of detecting it? But of course, we start with results when we go to the doctor and we want to know if we've actually got the thing, because sometimes there's errors. And flipping those things around are different statements, and it has to do with the underlying probability of the disease out of the population. So, and of course, that matters. 
probability statement is true, completely uncontroversial. I'll point out that this all begins with Bayes' demise. So Bayes doesn't get to publish his result, he doesn't get to show this off, he doesn't get to be celebrated. All very typical, isn't it? So it's like, nobody knows they made all these great breakthroughs. Uh, I'll point out that this was introduced to the Royal Society by Richard Price, who was going through his house and going through his drawers and found this article. So I'll read to you what he wrote, at least a, a snippet of what he wrote to the, the Royal Society. Read December 23rd, 1763. So there's that point in time. So this is a pivotal point in time. I now send you an essay which I have found among the papers of our deceased friend, Mr. Bates and which, in my opinion, has great merit and well deserves to be preserved. Experimental philosophy, you will find, is merely interested in the subject of it. So they use words differently than we use words. So he's saying that they're interested. If I said that I'm merely interested in something, I'm telling you the opposite. It's a little bit sarcastic these days. They have that in effect. And on this account, there seems to be a particular reason for thinking that a communication of it to the Royal Society cannot be improper. And I love this ending of the, the correspondence, that your inquiries may be rewarded with many future successes, and that you may enjoy every valuable blessing is the sincere wish of, sir, your very humble servant, Richard Price. I am still waiting for somebody to conclude an email like this to me. So it just warms my heart to see just the politeness of everything. Here's Bayes' theorem again. So I'll point out this is how maybe you would deal with this in a continuous set. So I've kind of butchered the notation all over the place. I'm thinking of theta as continuous, but I put the R right here. So I probably need to get rid of the R. So this is not a probability right here. This is the density function. So I'm multiplying the likelihood times the prior. Now, I would agree, I wrote the likelihood exactly opposite of the way that I've been writing it on the board. That I like the theta to be on the other side to denote that it's a function of the theta. Some people like to write it like this because it looks like phase is there. So you will see both versions of it, and it shouldn't hang you up. Oftentimes, I'll see people just write down f of x given theta. That's the likelihood. It's like, it's not. It's the sampling distribution. f is a different function. But it has the form of the likelihood. So it's the equation that you would write down. And people put your notation all the time. So there's no consensus on how you write this thing down. I think some people like writing it like this, because it looks like Bayes' theorem. But it breaks the meaning of the conditioning part. So lots of ways to write this down. In class, I usually flip those two things around. This isn't meant to confuse you, but I understand it's the same thing, but it's different, and that is confusing. So what I'm suggesting is if somebody tells you something is a likelihood, you know they took the sampling distribution, plugged in the data, and viewed the parameters is the variable in the function. So that's the posterior distribution, and the, the language is, a priori, this is what we believe theta was. And a posteriori, when we upgraded through the data, that's what we believe after we've seen the data. I really wish they didn't do this, you know, because it, it makes you feel like you need to have prior thoughts. It is a sequential updating tool. It can be viewed that way, but it doesn't have to be viewed that way. So this doesn't have to encompass my prior thoughts. Instead, this could encompass my ignorance as well. I can try to model my ignorance. So I'll give you an example. So if I were trying to infer a mu in a normal distribution, so that's a location parameter. And I'll just kind of point out, is I move it linearly to the right five units, the whole distribution moves to the right five units. So it just kind of shifts the distribution around. Um, it's a location, so you probably want a prior that doesn't inject information about the location. There's only one distribution in the universe I can think of that doesn't have information about location, and that's a distribution that I could slide back and forth and not tell that I've split it back and forth. There's only one function that looks like that, and that's the constant function. I said a lot 
maybe I've convinced you, maybe that's a good reason to take a prior distribution. It is if it's a location parameter. But in some sense, I'm not injecting any information about a, a location if I just use a flat prior. I'm gonna warn you against that real quickly. Don't always use a flat prior, horrible things can happen. So if you used a flat prior on like variance, it wouldn't be the right thing to do because that's a scale parameter. And we don't wanna inject information about scale, and that's a little bit different. I'll talk about that later as we start deriving some of these priors. I wanna start out um, with a Bayesian example where we're just flipping points. So again, Bernoulli point flip. So here's the encoding of everything. You're familiar with that. You can forget about this. These are typical questions that maybe a, a classicist might ask or something that you've been trained to do in STAT 101 class. I personally don't love doing hypothesis testing. You have to pick a hypothesis and then reject it if all of a sudden some key values in some extreme region. We'll talk about that when we get to chapter eight. Uh, but Bayesian wants to do something different. They want to construct a posterior distribution. At the end of the day, what do they do with the posterior distribution is a little bit different of a question, but the, all they're going to do is construct this. So they want a probability distribution, or the way I'm thinking about it, a density on P given all the point flips that you've seen. So they're going to build this conditional distribution. And this is going to represent your beliefs in what P is. I really like this because this is what we're going to construct is a probability distribution on probabilities. And I like thinking that way. And I've had people say, that doesn't make any sense. You want the probability of a probability? Anything that I want to express and talk about, I think it's reasonable to put a probability distribution on. So if that parameter is a probability, I think probabilities over probabilities does make sense. So any parameter you wish to talk about, Building up uncertainty through a probability distribution is a concept that makes sense to me. Notice that I'm just saying it's a concept. It's not even what I think is happening in the real universe. I don't think this is how the universe works. So I don't think these probability distributions are floating around. This is our measuring tool to measure what happens in the universe. It's the way I think about it. So that's my way out of these philosophical arguments about truth. I don't think you'll ever actually know it, and I don't think this is the absolute truth, and I don't think it's the only thing in town and the only way to do statistics. It's one way of thinking about things. So what is the Bayesian going to do? They're going to do this, and I butchered the notation yet again. This probably should be f of x i's given p. So that's I haven't actually talked about what the sampling distribution is. So I'm recycling pi all over the place and butchering notation all over again using it rather inconsistently. So now I'm starting to feel like everybody else in the universe. But basically, I'm just going to take my distribution on the data, multiply it by my prior, and I'm going to normalize it. So I just Bayes' theorem. So just Bayes' theorem again. And so we might want to ask some questions about what sort of prior information, what would you even think is reasonable here? No matter what you're thinking about over here, at the end of the day, just keep your eye on the prize, what we want to know. We want to know what P is. So it's not just a huge philosophical question here. We're trying to estimate P, and we want good properties out of that. So I'll kind of point out um, the likelihood function looks like this. So I call this the likelihood all of a sudden, and I kind of switch the way I'm thinking about it. So this is just the binomial distribution. You could have thought of this as the Bernoulli, and that would just be this part right here. We'll write this down slowly on the board next time and derive this. So this is really all we care about. No matter how we normalize it, we'll notice that we're going to have cancellation in that normalizing constant down here. And then we need some prior. And I'm going to motivate this with a beta distribution, and I'm going to say betas are maybe a good distribution to look at. And that's where I want to start the conversation next time. The first thing I'm thinking about with betas is betas live between 0 and 1. So that's something maybe we know. This is the form of the beta distribution. So I'd like to talk about this for a little while next time. And then kind of talk about what this posterior even looks like and what it's doing and how it's adapting to the change in the data. So I can sequentially march through this posterior as I collect data. And that's what I want to focus on for a little while. 
you can be asking yourself, what other distributions might I put on P? So let me just ask you guys before we go, once I get one decent answer, everybody's excused. What distribution would you naturally think of to put on P a priority if you didn't want to inject any information? Uniform zero. The uniform zero one, yeah, exactly. Everybody's still in run for it. Why not just use the uniform zero one? What I want to point out is a beta one one for this parameter alpha and beta. So that's a hyperparameter in the distribution. If these are both one, this is a uniform. So if I put in alpha is one here, that's zero in the exponent, so this is all one. Same thing happens here. And you can verify that the beta function is one in that case as well. It's the normalizing thing. So betas are bounded between zero and one, so I can flatten this thing out just by specifying this. So the uniform lives in this class of models. So I'm gonna generalize a little bit more and kind of talk about the prior is I have knobs and I have things I can kind of change. I will point out that the uniform prior is not optimal frequentist in the sense that if I look at intervals I construct based off of this uh, posterior distribution, if I use the uniform prior, uh, some frequentist could come out and beat me by coming up with other intervals to cover the truth more often. So I just said something kind of weird that the Bayesian can maybe be the optimal frequentist if I use a different prior. And this is the way I think about things, that is there a prior out there that makes me appealing to the other camp? And would I even like that prior in the first place? And it turns out there's lots of rationale for using other priors other than uniform. So I'll just say real quickly, we're not going to drive this right here in this class anytime soon. I might do it maybe in a review session for you, but the beta half-half is the optimal frequentist prior. That was proven in the 70s by Jerry Brown of the UPenn. So he showed that a Bayesian method could be optimal frequentist. And that's kind of cool. So it turns out there's not these two camps, but there's lots of overlap between the camps. And maybe that's the way we should be thinking about things. Sam? When he proved the beta half half, did he use the fact that it was a W prior at all? Or? I don't think so. So he had a completely different part of that's right. Yeah. yeah, he had a calculus of variations of But you could derive Jeffries that way. So, but I don't think that's what they were thinking about, but later on all these things start colliding. And when you see there's all kinds of different ways to think about things and you get the same answers, that becomes really appealing. So there's lots of ways of deriving that thing. We'll come back to that conversation on Monday. So we're gonna go slow for a while and then we're gonna pick up some time. If you want to get ahead, um, start reading chapter six, at least through sufficiency. It's really interesting. And try to look at that proof on what a sufficient statistic is. I remember when I was in grad school, I understood the steps of the proof, but I really did not understand what was going on. And I asked one of my office mates, I said, Sean, help me out with this, I don't get it. And he starts showing me the steps of the proof, and I'm like, I get that, I just don't understand what the proof is really getting at. There's a few of these steps I just don't understand mentally. I get them mathematically. So see if you understand exactly what the argument is that they invoke with the two experimenters. If it doesn't work out for you, um, I'll tell you what me and Sean came up with. So Sean told me, Scotland did so obvious. And then four hours later, we were still grappling with it. And then eventually it became obvious. So I think sometimes things at first glance aren't obvious, and then they feel obvious once you finally have that moment. I'll try to explain that proof to you a little bit differently than the way the book is. Thanks, you guys. Have a great weekend. We'll be back for a review session next Thursday. So homework due in a, a 